Because some may not agree with what I have to say, I would direct these remarks primarily to our granddaughters. The rest of you may listen if you should care to. On Brittany's last birthday, I told her mother with considerably grandfatherly pride that I thought I detected some seeds of promise developing in Brittany. Of course, I feel the same way about Nicole, Melissa, Kellyanne, Katie, Sarah, and little Ashley, our other granddaughters. I do not want to tell you girls what you must be. That is for each of you to decide. You have your free agency. Each of you will have to work very hard to learn all you can and develop your skills. It will not be easy to achieve anything really worthwhile. I want only to tell you what I think will help bring to you identity, value, and happiness as a person. I also want to challenge you to reach your potential, to become a person of great worth, to become a great woman. Because you descended from great women, each of you has the potential to become a great woman. Now you need to know that to me, great does not necessarily mean you're becoming a great doctor, lawyer, or business executive. You may, of course, become any of these if you so desire and if you work hard enough. And I would be proud of such an achievement. However, to me, greatness is much, much more. I hope that each of you girls will become an individual of significant worth and a person of virtue so that your contributions are maintained in both human and eternal terms. Elder Boyd K. Packer tells me that among the species of birds where both male and female sing, they sing a different melody, yet it is pleasant to hear them singing at the same time, and they harmonize beautifully together. There can be no question but that women are wonderful and special. You also have a great mission a great errand and a great calling. The work of God was devised by God for both men and women. All those who receive my gospel are sons and daughters in my kingdom. Being born as women brings to you many endowments that are not common to men and therefore make you unique. President Spencer W. Kimball, in speaking of the roles of men and women, said, in a way that adds some personal perspective, within these great assurances, however, our roles and assignments differ. There are these eternal differences, with women being given many tremendous responsibilities of motherhood and sisterhood and men given the tremendous responsibility of fatherhood and priesthood. But man is not without the woman, or the woman without the man in the Lord. He continues, Remember in the world before we came here, faithful women were given certain assignments, while faithful men were foreordained to certain priesthood tasks. While we do not now remember the particulars, this does not alter the glorious reality of what we once agreed to. You are accountable for those things which long ago were agreed to and expected of you, just as are those we sustain as prophets and apostles. This leaves much to be done by way of parallel personal development for both men and women." Close quote. This statement suggests that before we were born we made certain commitments, female and male, and that we agreed to come to this earth with great, rich, but separate gifts. We were called male and female to do great works. 
with separate approaches and separate assignments, and accordingly were given different songs to sing. You say, where do I begin? Rather than beginning with a wish list of all of the things you want in life, the real question may be what you are not willing to do without. You should select two or three of life's experiences you are absolutely sure you want to have. You should not leave important things to chance. Then you should think about what you can contribute to society by way of service to the Church, home, and community. You need also to think of what life will demand from you. Everything has its price. Much is expected of us. It is unfortunate that it has taken so long to bring full economic justice to women. The feminization of poverty is both real and tragic. That is why you should work very hard to prepare for your future with some marketable skills. The struggle to improve the place of women in society has been a noble cause, and I sincerely hope the day will come when women with equal skills will be fully equal with men in the marketplace. However, this is an issue of equality, not sameness, and does not mean that women should be the same as men or try to do things the way men do them. Although some jobs that are traditionally masculine are now being done by women, it is possible for them to be done in a feminine way and yet be done equally as well or possibly even better. Over a hundred years ago, in 1872, Eliza R. Snow said that some women are so extreme in their theories that they would set her in antagonism to man and make her adopt the more reprehensible phases of character which men present and which should be shunned or improved by them instead of being copied by women." Close quote. Becoming like men is not the answer. Being who you are and living up to your potential and commitment is. You cannot trust the many conflicting voices that clamor about what women should or should not do in today's society. Some of the loudest voices we hear are echoes of others who, rather than being unhappy with their role as women, seem actually out of harmony with themselves and out of tune with life in general. Women today are being encouraged by some to have it all. Money, travel, marriage, motherhood, and separate careers in the world. Sarah Davidson, in an article entitled Having It All, comments about forging an identity, building a career, developing a craft, and having a family. She answers the question about how the woman who is intent on having it all can coordinate the roles of professional life, marriage, and motherhood. I do not yet understand, she says, how a woman can successfully split herself between home and the marketplace. Fifteen years of feminist theory and action have taught us that sacrificing one for the other does not satisfy, but having both together simultaneously is so difficult that no one I know has found anything but the most quirky and incomplete solution. Close quote. Some will no doubt disagree with this conclusion, and there may be many exceptions. But she goes on to tell that of three women who are partners in a New York law firm and observes that their personal lives are terrible, continues Sarah Davidson. The problem, of course, is that family happiness is less clearly definable and often more elusive than career success." Close quote. For some, the answer has been to find and marry a man who will assume the female roles. But such men are rare. 
it seems to me much more difficult for men to assume the female roles in the home than for women. The same author says, At some point along the way a number of us woke up and found that we were wonderfully self-sufficient and successful, and our lives were empty. There was no one to share it with, no living growing ties to the future. Something vital had been discarded, and we scurried to recapture it. As Sarah Davidson approached 40, she and her husband were blessed with a baby. Of this phenomenon, she says, This baby was the great missing link for me, the one I have longed for in my life. That, once realized, brought the hoped-for satisfaction. Nothing in my life prepared me for the happiness, the wholeness I felt when my son was born. I am embarrassed to tell you how many nights I would walk him into his room and just stand at the crib, my heart brimming. The bond between a mother and a child is so special, it is in the soul. She goes on to say, all my time is spent on three things, the baby, work, and keeping the marriage going. I find I can handle two beautifully when my husband is out of town or when I'm between projects and not working. Things go smoothly, but three pushes me to the edge. Someone is unhappy. Something always is getting short shrift. No doubt it would help if husbands would follow the counsel of the late Elder G. Homer Durham. Man, as well as woman, has obligations to learn the difficult art of fatherhood in homemaking. This is not a task just for the woman." Close quote. And so, my dear granddaughters, it would seem that you cannot do all of these things at the same time. You cannot eat all of the pastries in the baking shop at once. You will get a terrible tummy ache. You cannot be a 100% wife, a 100% mother, a 100% church worker, a 100% queer person, and a 100% public service person at the same time. How do all these roles coordinate, says Sarah Davidson? The only answer I can come up with is that you can have it sequentially. At one stage you may emphasize career, at another marriage and nurturing young children, and at any point you will be aware of what is missing. If you are lucky, you will be able to fit everything in." Close quote. Sequentially is a big word, meaning to do things one at a time at different times. In the book of Ecclesiastes it says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. It seems that the new roles of women have not decreased their responsibility because while the new roles are challenging, the old roles of wife and mother are in the soul and cry out to be satisfied. It is in the soul to want to be loved, to love and be loved by a good man, and be able to respond to the God-given deepest feelings of womanhood, those of being a mother and a nurturer. Fortunately, women do not have to track a career like a man does. She may fit more than one career into the various seasons of life. She cannot sing all of the verses of her song at the same time. Granddaughters, do not be deceived in your quest for happiness and an identity of your own. <coughs> Entreating voices may tell you that what you've experienced in your own homes, that which you've seen your mothers and grandmothers do, is old-fashioned, unchallenging, boring, and drudgery. It may very well have been old-fashioned and perhaps routine, and at times it was drudgery. But your mothers and grandmothers have sung a song that expressed the highest love and the noblest of womanly feelings. 
they have been nurturers and teachers. I join Brigham Young in saying, daughters, use all your gifts to build up righteousness in the earth. I hope you would acquire all the knowledge you can. Become as skillful as you can, but not exclusively in the new careers at the expense of the primary ones, or you may find that you have missed singing the song you were supposed to sing. Some divisive voices would suggest that the wants and needs of women in society have changed, and that political power is the primary interest and need of women in this day. This would not seem to be so. A recent poll indicated that the present individual priorities of women are, first, a strong family, second, raising children, three, growing spiritually, and four, economic equity. This means that the values of women in this country are compatible with, but perhaps not quite as strong, the values of women in your church. You need not be defensive or ashamed of these priorities of family, children, church, and equal economic opportunities. Your grandmother and I have urged your mothers to get an education, not only to help them in their homemaking, but also to prepare them to earn a living outside the home if that became necessary. Going to college is a wonderful experience, but the dollars, the effort, and the time are much better used if the education also prepares the student to have a marketable skill. I have said that you are wonderful, special, and unique for many reasons. Let me tell you some of these reasons. Women seem to arrive at decisions based upon a different value system. I have noticed that your grandmother thinks considerably from her heart. My approach seems more logical. Your grandmother is concerned about how those if decisions affect people around her. Beverly Campbell talks about it this way. For a woman, her primary concern is what will be the greatest good for the greatest number of those around her. In value terms, this would be called care and mercy. For men, the research indicated that the moral thought process was probably much more direct. It generally boiled down to hard and fast rules of right and wrong, black and white. Sister Campbell says, Could it be that we, each of us, man and woman, were endowed at the time of creation with two distinct but equally important traits? traits which are both essential and complementary and bound to be used together in wisdom for the greatest good of all mankind." Close quote. <clears throat> it may not be possible for economic reasons, but if you have the choice, do not abandon too quickly the full-time career of marriage and mothering. Some will criticize you and say you have no gumption that you lack brains, that you have no ambition, or even that you are seeking to get your fulfillment from others. As you go forward with a professional career, remember that no one will love you more than those in your own home. In the business or scientific world, probably no one would consider you to be perfect. But your little ones, for a time, will think you are perfect. And, if you are wise, they will adore you for eternity. No one will need more of your time and energy and attention on a 24-hour basis than your family. Their needs will not go away during the daytime working hours. There is the advantage that in working 24 hours a day on family relations, you are working on eternal relations. Thus. You will also have more time to serve in the administration of the Lord's Church on earth, where your service is so valued and needed. You don't have to earn money to be important. 
You don't have to. You may choose not to sell your time. I hope your husbands will be more helpful than I have been. But homemaking is whatever you make of it. Every day brings satisfaction along with some work which may be frustrating, routine, drudgery, and then challenging. But it is the same in the law office, the dispensary, the library, or the store. There is, however, no important job than homemaking. C.S. Lewis said it. It is the one for which all others exist. You all know that I adore your grandmother. To me, she is the greatest person in the world. She has done more than anyone except my own mother who gave me life. I hold this view not in spite of the fact that she is a woman, but because she is a woman. She has brought to flower and fruitage the many divine qualities of womanhood at their noblest and best. I can give you no better model than she. Now it is very important, whatever you do, that you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It is important that you accept without reservation the Savior for what he was, and Joseph Smith for what he said he was, and Spencer W. Kimball for what he is. God will not ennoble a person, man or woman, who refuses to uphold by faith, prayer, and works those whom God has called and ordained to preside over them. So, my dear granddaughters, you will want to sustain the priesthood authority. Some women may feel that it is subversive to their free agency to be directed by the power of the priesthood. This feeling comes from misunderstanding. There should be no compulsion, duress, or unrighteous dominion involved in priesthood authority. President Stephen L. Richards stated, our accord comes from universal agreement with righteous principles and common response to the operation of the Spirit of our Father. It is actuated by no fear except one, and that is the fear of offending God, the author of our work." Close quote. Following the priesthood of the Church is an expression of faith in the Lord's continuing guidance of his Church. It is a willing acceptance of the principle of divine agency. Girls, you must practice virtue in its largest sense. Of the many definitions of virtue, such as moral excellence, right action and thinking, goodness of character, chastity in women, I also appreciate the definition in theology. Virtue in theology is the order of angels. You cannot become a great woman if you are not also a good woman. You will become great women if you join an, angel, an order of angels. You may ask, how do I join an order of angels? My answer is that you must hunger and thirst after righteousness. William Law, an 18th century clergyman, said, if you have not chosen the kingdom of God first, it will in the end make no difference what you have chosen instead." Close quote. I will tell you of one of the great women I have known for over 40 years. Sister Isabel Bangeter, age 93, is the mother of 11 outstanding children. My missionary companion, Elder William Grant Bangeter, is the second eldest of these children. Our governor, Norman Bangener, is the tenth child. She has a posterity of over 240. All those who are married have been married in the temple. All of the males but two have gone on missions. There have been no divorces among her family. As I have wondered what made Isabel Bangeter so great, I have concluded that it was because she hungered and thirsted for righteousness. 
she sang all of the verses of her song in her home and in the church. President Kimball said it well when he stated, Among the real heroines in the world who will come into the church are women who are more concerned with being righteous than being selfish. These real heroines have true humility which places a higher value on integrity than on visibility. Remember, it is as wrong to do things just to be seen of women as it is to do things to be seen of men. Great women and men are always more anxious to serve than to have dominion." Close quote. Next to last, you will have to answer to your naturally, natural womanly instincts, which the Prophet Joseph said are according to their natures. You should respond generously to these instincts and promptings to do good. With your very being held still, you should listen to the whisperings of the Holy Spirit. You should follow the noble, intuitive feelings planted deep within your soul by deity in the previous world. In this way, you will be responding to the Holy Spirit of God and will be sanctified by truth. By so doing, you will be eternally honored and loved. Much of your work is to enrich mankind. Care and mercy seem to be a dominant refrain of the song you have the opportunity to sing. I hope you will not leave any of the melody unsung. Lastly, how do I think you, my beloved granddaughters, may become great women? You should cultivate and employ generously your noble womanly instincts of care and mercy. You should always hunger and thirst after righteousness within the framework of the revealed gospel of Jesus Christ. And finally, most of what you do should be done with an eternal per perspective. That this may be so, I pray humbly in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.